solitary confinement, in a prison smock, mourning the death of my grandfather, coming down off of illicit substances. It was at that moment I knew my life needed to change. Hello everyone, I'm Joey Carbstrong. I'd like to thank you all for coming. opportunity to speak in front of so many people. Uh, I'm going to take you on a journey, just got a disclaimer here, because I'm going to take you on a journey of my life, but my life, just warning to you, my life has uh, explicit depictions of violence, uh, drug abuse and serious mental health issues, so there are also many things I can't talk about, so I try to keep things general for a reason. I don't want to incriminate anyone from my past, and I won't be mentioning names of people or names of gangs. Number one, it's incredibly dangerous to do so, as you can imagine, and number two, just out of respect for people's privacy of my past. I'm not trying to glorify that world, there's nothing to glorify about it. I have a lot of trauma because of my past, but this is just my story, and I've chosen to be vulnerable in front of 7,000 people today. <laughs> so, this little, little potato is me, that's my dad, that's my mum there. I, we didn't have much money back then, we lived in a caravan, and uh, mum had me sleeping on top of the dresser there. Uh, my brother had the cot, and uh, mum told me a story about this uh, dresser in the caravan. I fell off of it. I was about a few weeks old. I shouldn't have been wriggling around, but I did. I was a wriggly little baby, and uh, fell off, hit my head, and my dad had to jump through the fly screen to rush me to the hospital in a pram because they couldn't afford a car. So just giving you an idea of my humble beginnings, and look at that little dumpling head. That's me, this baby Joey. And uh, there's me as a sailor in the middle with my blue ball. <laughs> and uh, this is me and my brother. I always, I like to tell this story because when I went vegan, become a little bit lucid and conscious, I remember this story of me and my brother on Christmas morning and my little brother was playing close to some ants and I remember being Christmas, I didn't want him to hurt the ants, so I'd like, stop Josh, you're going you're gonna to squash them and that. And that speaks to the innate compassion we're all born with and somewhere along the way it is conditioned out of us. Yeah. And not just my compassion for non-human animals, but also later on conditioned to gang violence. This is uh, me, young Joey, pretty young there. And uh, my family life, uh, my family was... Uh, was to it was a broken home essentially, it was a lot of, uh, I was around a lot of fighting, a lot of partying, a lot of alcohol abuse. I love my mum, my mum was amazing in many ways, she always put food on the table but she had her own issues and I was around things I shouldn't have been. I was essentially in a war zone, having night terrors, nightmares a lot from as long as I could remember. Just giving you a little bit of insight from where I come from. This is skateboarding Joey, this is the next phase of Joey's life, you know, with my little skateboarding shoes. I was sponsored by a uh, place called Skate Effect, so I skated uh, a lot and uh, started to, you know, smoke a bit of weed, but I was in a good community there. It was like, it was chill, there was like cool hippie vibes and skateboarding and stuff, so I was safe in that environment because the environment is very important as you'll come to see. And this is me starting to become rebellious, leaving, I left school at 14 years old, shaving my head, using, starting to use drugs, uh, you know, and uh, thinking I was all that and a bit, and uh, this is me and my mates. This is when I started, I left the skateboarding, you know, crew and started hanging around with these guys here. <laughs> That's me down the bottom, by the way, and yes, we are partying, and don't let the baby faces fool you. We were 15, between 15 and 17, and we were quite hectic. We would have incredibly violent, the violent street fights and gate crash parties, and we would fight people that were 40, 35, 40 years old at that age. We were, there's about 20 of us, all boxers, and uh, yeah, not up to no good a lot of the time. So this is me learning to adapt, learning to survive, getting a bit old, about 18, 19 here, and uh, just, you know, trying to adapt and survive in the environment, and getting older, my drug use also intensified, and there I am, um, 
This happened on my, birth, my brother's birthday party. Someone hit my brother in the face and there was about eight of them and I walked up to them by myself. So I'm very defensive of my brother and had a big uh, bar fight. It was me onto the rest of them. And I was throwing ashtrays and bar stools and one of them grabbed a Jack Daniels bottle from over the bar and knocked me out. Um, I got up, started drinking, <laughs> went back out partying. I was like, where are they? My brother's, you've been knocked out for 10 minutes, mate. Uh, you know, but that's the type of dude I was. We'd get a big brawls, had many stitches in my head and I'd go back out and party. I was committing extreme acts of violence in nightclubs and bars because the environment, I was actually, it all stems from fear, like if you've been bullied when you're younger, you overcompensate it for it when you're older, you don't want to be the victim again, so that's why I was, I would do something very extreme and violent to someone, so it's, it's kind of like, it's a message, leave me alone. I was actually quite scared inside, but it's the environment that shapes you, so if I take someone, one, two, three, four, out of your environment, put you in a harsh environment, especially growing up, that environment it's going to shape you into the person you become. You essentially have to learn to sink or swim or you sink, and, you know, become a shark or get eaten by the sharks. That's kind of like that out there. It's pretty crazy. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about the earlier days, some of the violence I witnessed. Um, so we were all going to a party. I was a bit older at this stage. We were going to a party and uh, it was people we didn't know. We had someone with us we didn't know too well now. I knew him a little bit, but he got in an altercation with one of the older guys at this party and this older guy punched him in the face and we didn't know, but he had a, a backpack filled with knives and he ended up uh, stabbing this older guy in the, the neck and in the forehead and it was horrible and uh, my mates took chase against the stabber and beat him up and I, I, I took chase against the, the victim to try to help him, but he thought I might be sort of chasing him to attack him. I'd just taken two ecstasy tablets and I was, they were kicking in really intensely and it was quite strong back then and I'm running after this guy who's, he's really bleeding out because he's running his blood is pumping and I said to him dude I'm not gonna hurt you if you don't stop running you're gonna die like you're bleeding to death and he looked at me he's like no 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 and I, I just held him and he was cold and then he just went to jelly in my arms and fell on the floor now I'm tripping out at this stage like oh my god so I'm trying to stay calm take my t-shirt off stuff it down the hole in his neck and I've got my mate's partner to hold, his, he had a flap of skin, he got stabbed in the head essentially, he's holding, and I'm just talking to him, do you have any kids mate, just, everything's going to be okay. The ambulance goes to the wrong uh, supermarket, so, you know, if I, if I wasn't there, no one else was helping, if I wasn't there, he would have died. I mean, I come back to the party, blood all over me. It was pretty crazy, and, you know, these things, this was one that stuck with me, but these things happened, you know, quite often. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about like what happens on the streets. You can have a fight with someone and yeah, there might not be retaliation, but more often than not, there's going to be retaliation. You're going to create enemies for life that you have to constantly watch your back uh, about. And that's uh, where the mental health issues sort of stem from. But I got in an altercation with someone at a really rough uh, bar and he sort of a, he did something, disrespected someone that was really close to me and I uh, hit him with the bottle. And that, that wasn't unusual behavior, by the way. It was just another Friday, Thursday night or whatever. But we are uh, wrestling on the floor and the guards came to help me. Uh, the guards knew me and they, they came to help me and chased this guy off and were hitting him and, you know, just normal sort of things. He ended up coming back that next week. This guy was someone and he was someone dangerous. He came back that next week looking for us and he came back and he stabbed the guards, nearly killed them and he was looking for me. Uh, one of the guards had to have uh, three uh, heart operations just to save his life. So just trying to give you a paint, a little picture of like what happens on the streets, retaliation, violence, you mess with someone, they can come back and murder you, you know, you just never know. Started growing up a bit more, this is uh, another gang that I was involved with, uh, these weren't the highest level of gang but we were quite uh, solid and we weren't just your normal street gang anymore, we had uh, club rooms and things like this, got them tattooed on my stomach. Still got a lot of respect for these guys, but uh, this doesn't, gang doesn't exist anymore. At that time as well, I started to living, living with a high level respected gang member on the far left, uh, is it that side, and uh, he was part of a very high level uh, gang, and they were the big boys, they were the made men, they were the ones you don't mess with. I got a lot of respect for him, I learned a lot of him, and he was a really nice guy. You just don't want to get on this wrong side, the wrong people to get on the wrong side of. But I, uh, this is essentially what I was living with for two years, so I've seen a lot and absorbed a lot. I also didn't see nothing, if you know what I mean. Um, 
drug use increased again, you know, uh, using, uh, snorting drugs, drinking, binge drinking alcohol, smoking methamphetamine, um, getting really into it at this stage. The, the violence around me increased, getting a lot more serious. So serious, in fact, one night, I got a, my, the mate that I was living with got a phone call, about 17 phone calls in a row, and I'm like, he's asleep, I better answer this. Like, I'd never answer his phone, I'd be too scared of getting beaten up. But I answered it, and something really bad had happened. Their gang were at a, a nightclub and got an altercation with some other guys, and I thought, no one's going to mess with these guys. These are the these are the big boys, no one's going to do anything to them. Turns out there are people out there who would do anything to anyone, Like, they're, they're, and I didn't realise that at that stage. And, Reality check, they guys come back and shot up uh, the group of uh, my mates and uh, they, one of them got shot really badly, uh, some of them just took leg shots, but he, my, my friend, he was a big guy, about 40 years old and I really thought he was a real tough dude, and he is, but he got shot in the stomach and um, uh, rumour has it, bullet hit him in the head and then he got kicked on the ground and still cat boots on and he, he actually died three times on the way to hospital. They revived him, he was on life support in the morning, thought he was going to die. I remember being out the back, uh, this is the first time I've ever experienced something like this, it was like, wow, like, please don't die, I was praying outside, you know, I went back inside and uh, my mate, he'd been through this before, he'd lost friends to shootings on the streets and he tapped me on the shoulder trying to console me, like, yeah, I know, mate, you know, you, this is it, this is reality, this is a reality of that world when you get out there with those guys, you know, people can get shot, get killed, and, uh, you know, that's it, game over, but... I want to tell you about the time I actually nearly did get killed and uh, happened because of my own belligerence and attitude and I went out one night with a weapon in my pocket, had a fight uh, at home and I was like, no, that's it, I'm going out. Uh, you know, I was out there drinking, taking drugs and we got to this bar and there's some other belligerent people just like us who wanted to fight too and I was like, oh yeah, they can't be at our bar, this is our bar, you know. And I was like, my mate's like, look, settle down, Joey, settle down. I'm like, no, 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 mate, like I thought I was a hero, you know, and I walked up and it's not that I started the fight, I just didn't avoid it. Like, I didn't necessarily say anything too cheeky, I just said something like, you know, I knew that was going to be on because of the way they were acting, they were aggressive. He punched me straight in the front teeth and then it was on a very violent altercation. I won't go into specific details, but there was a lot of blood. It wasn't ours. It was from them and um, they hopped in the car. They got in this car, they drove around, they sped straight past me, <laughs> nearly killed me, I just got out of the way, okay? They sped around the back of the, there was two car, there was two entrances to this car park, they come back through, speeding through, really fast. Now before I had time to react, and I'm full of, you know, adrenaline, thinking I'm young, I'm stupid, my friends, one on each side, split up, and just got out of the way, and I had to jump up and I got hit. Went about roof height, flipped in the air, when they say your life flashes before your eyes, it actually does. I did in a split moment. It was like doo -doo 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 -doo, like, like little flickering slideshows of my life. And I was like, in the air. I'm like, I'm, I went out tonight with a bad attitude. And I started, I, I got involved with a fire I could have avoided. And I got what I asked for, and now I'm dead. That's what I felt like I'm in the air. And I just instilled this principle of what you put out, you get back. What goes around, comes around. And that's why I've got the karma slide up here. Hit the deck. I got up and I, had, I was checking my body to see if anything was poking out of me. You know, organs, things like that. All I remember is red blood just pouring down my face. And my friend, he couldn't, he, my friend thought I was dead. He couldn't, he was in shock basically. Rushed me to the hospital, couldn't walk for a week. A week and uh, let's just say the guys who ran me over, I didn't see him for, <laughs> they thought, oh God, we've made a mistake here. But let's move along. This is uh, some of our craziest years here. This is me. I still got the scar on my neck from being run over, split open and stuff. Just giving you an idea idea of where I come from so you, you know where I'm at now and why I am the way I am and you know and in this world there's a lot of uh, drugs, uh, drug trade, debt collecting, things like that. The, the language that speaks in this world is fear and violence, that's just the way it is. People don't go off love and compassion like in the vegan <laughs> world. <laughs> It's fear and violence, and uh, respect does go a long way, but you know, people will still rob you even if you show them respect. And uh, there was, uh, I was carrying guns and knives and hammers, and people were having, you know, often you'd hear of stabbings, people were being stabbed and being, having their legs broken, being put in boots of cars, and having their house uh, peppered with bullets. Um, this sort of stuff happened. Um, there's a lot of treachery and deception in that world, gaslighting, you don't know what is what. 
who's telling what. No one tells you the real story, and uh, you never really know where you stand with people. I, there was a lot. I OD a lot of times, uh, taking a lot of drugs and fantasy and Xanax to try to, you know, I was living it. I was already traumatized and just trying to cover up the things I was doing. I don't know. I was, uh, had a bit of trauma from childhood, and I just was pummeling the drugs into me, alcohol abuse. But I was around some of the most dangerous gang uh, underworld figures in South Australia. A lot of them my friends, some of them not, but these people were they're very dangerous. You step a foot wrong, you know, you're in trouble. Now I heard rumours people, serious people were trying to, were out to get me and uh, took those rumours seriously. I would sleep with a loaded gun uh, all the time. Um, I would set the house up with weapons to protect myself, made little bottles filled with, you know, fuel just in, with a lighter just in case, you know. I was paranoid, horrible way to live. I'd be outside sometimes all night behind an open black umbrella, peeking over it with a gun behind, thinking people are coming to get me. Does insane things to your psychology, living like that in a constant, constant, constant war zone. Um, sometimes you had problems so far, like so many complex problems and filled with so much anxiety and trauma that, you know, you would think about suicide and, you know, I remember putting a gun in my mouth and just flicking the safety off and teasing the idea of pulling the trigger. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, so I'm very grateful that I didn't pull the trigger back then and, and do something stupid. I wouldn't have had this opportunity to Me too. You know, change my life. And leave it So at this stage, I'm really bad, you know, I just look like I'm sitting there with my mouth open, I'm actually really messed up here in my mind. Um, something can happen when you're taking drugs in that world, you can become, you know, you don't really know reality from, you know, your mind, and you, you can, mind can play tricks on you, you can have episodes, I had an episode, and uh, I had some episodes often, but I ended up in detained in a mental health ward, and they drugged me up and kept me there, I couldn't leave. Um, this is my grandfather here, this is where my grandfather comes into the story. Uh, he was dying of cancer at the time and he came to visit me at the mental health ward and he burst out in tears and started bawling his eyes out that his grandson, little grandson, was in that position and I feel deep shame for putting him through that he was already dying, he was already terminally ill and uh, you know, I'll never forgive myself for that. So, also in a mental health, just give you an idea of a mental health facility, like I did uh, get aggressive in there, someone, a nurse, I felt disrespected me, I got aggressive. Sirens go off, four guards come in, hold you down, tranquilize you with a, ne uh, with a needle full of some type of tranquilizer and fall asleep, wake up 18 hours later, like what just happened. They released me on antipsychotic medication, respiridone for schizophrenia, antidepressants, things like this. And I uh, got straight back on the drugs, didn't I? I didn't learn my lesson, did I? No, no, not yet, not yet, still coming. Now, uh, one night I was caught driving a car, uh, uh, drinking. There was a, uh, I actually got breath breathalyzed. I used my older brother's name. They processed me under my older brother's name. Thanks, I mean, thank you, but sorry, my older brother. <laughs> Uh, it turns out there was a gun on the back seat, so when the car got impounded, he got a call in the morning saying, you've been driving a car, there's a gun on the back seat. He's like, oh, so he called me, what the hell's going on? So I was like, okay, so I called the police station and said, look, I was driving the car. Wasn't my gun though, and then cops started to look for me then, and I was like, well, I'm not dealing with the cops, I'm on this drug bender, I'm leaving. So that's me, I was on the run then. On the run, you know, police were coming to my house, raiding, 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 causing my mum a lot of hardship, my grandfather was dying, and he actually passed away while I was on the run. Um, so I wasn't really there to be supportive to my mother. And uh, the police knew he passed away, they seen the funeral card there, so they're like, we're gonna wait for Joey when he gets back for his grandfather's funeral, because my suit was laid out. I got there at my mum's one morning for the funeral, and uh, the police had just left, and I freaked out, and I grabbed my stuff, and I left again. So, missed my grandfather's funeral, uh, was at a building site, uh, thinking helicopters were overhead and stuff. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> loved my grandfather and I wasn't there for his funeral because of this. This is the actual article. This is where I uh, got a hotel room. I had a bunch of uh, weapons on me. I had gun, loaded gun, bullets, ammunition, uh, flick knives, knuckle dusters, uh, stolen property. 
I was essentially, uh, I needed all those weapons to defend myself. There was some dangerous people around. It's that type of environment. You don't. The reason people carry guns is because other people have guns. If no one else had one, you probably wouldn't need one. And uh, I, I was at this hotel room. We're out the front of the hotel room. Uh, someone locked their keys in the car, the person I was with. We actually went, were going to go get some more drugs. I had the gun down my trousers. She was trying to get into the car. The cops uh, got called, thinking we were breaking into the car. And they come to see what was going on. They're like, what are you doing? She said, it's my car. It's my car. Well, you know, it turns out the police searched me, got away with it a little bit for a little while. And then they, they checked the car, found out it wasn't stolen. Police are like, you can go, but I'm just going to check you one more time, sir. He checked me one more time, and there he goes, pulls out the gun, and that was it. They take it very seriously if you get caught with a gun in Australia. It was no joke, and I uh, ended up in G Division in Yala, which is the punishment unit. Um, they put me in the punishment unit because it's solitary confinement, and they put me in there under suicide watch. It's militant, it's insane in there. It's, you can hear prisoners, very dangerous prisoners they put in here, and uh, you, you basically uh, kept away from everyone, and they'll do two sex cell checks a day. You can't even have a fingerprint on the stainless steel in there. The stainless steel in there, you have to have everything clean. Um, if you scratch your nose while the guards are in there, they will beat you up. Uh, they don't mess around in there. They will take anything as a threat. So um, you have to really. This was like the hardest part of the prison. I was mourning the death of my grandfather, coming down off of all these drugs and dealing with everything that I've done. It was rock bottom. This was rock bottom for me. Uh, I hit a couple of rock bottoms, but this was definitely one of the worst. Um, you, you literally don't even know what time it is in there. Uh, you have to judge by the sun. It's just long and grueling. Five days later though, I was released on house arrest. Here I am on house arrest. What is house arrest? They basically put a little tag on you, make sure you don't leave your house uh, while I was on bail. On bail, awaiting to be uh, sentenced for the garden. Hadn't learned my lesson yet. No, not yet. It's coming. Uh, there I am here. Back into the gangs, back into the drugs, back into the violence. That's all I knew. That's all my friends knew. That's what else? What, what other? Well, how could I break my consciousness out of that right now? I just couldn't. I also, uh, oh, this is me, but let's go back. I also joined one of the, after this, I joined one of the most uh, dangerous feared gangs in Australia. Um, the violence didn't uh, leave me though on Home D. Like I could tell you a story, I got an altercation with some of the people who used to be my friends. They come to my house my, when my family was there. I went out the front with a tomahawk and a knife. These were dangerous people, and I smashed the window and had to stab him through the window of the car. They were there, and my family was there, you know. And this was happening while I was on house arrest. Stabbed him in the leg, just a deterrent kind of thing, like get away from up here. And uh, I was also, uh, you know, got, got in the middle of some problems while on house arrest and got held hostage at gunpoint on my birthday. Happy birthday. Very scary. Um, but that's just what that world is. You know, they don't call the police in that world. They deal with it in different ways. If you, if you want to be part of that world, which I definitely advise against, that's how things get dealt with. This is me, super fat. Look at the size of my belly. It's no, there's no issue with being um, overweight or, or larger. There's no, like, it's fine as long as you're happy with it yourself. It doesn't matter, but I was definitely not. I was um, really big, uh, 40 kilograms heavier than I am now. And I was depressed on medications and I just was, just felt horrible. I was looking for a diet to lose weight. This is how I was just like, I've had enough. I've had enough, you know, I don't want to feel like this anymore. And I come across a, a fruit and vegetable juicer named Dan McDonald, the life regenerator on YouTube. Like you wouldn't think a gang member would be sitting there watching Dan the Man, but uh, I was. He was wearing weeds, juicing fruits and vegetables. He was talking about the power of fruits and vegetables, and I was like, who's this dude, man? But, and uh, I thought I'd try it. I thought I'd try it, did some fruits and vegetable juices, green juice. I was like, I drank it, I was like, oh my god. This is like, I was like off my head. I was like, this is like natural meth. I was calling my mates, like, you've got to get some of this natural meth. This is amazing. Like, it's, this is our first fruit, piece of fruit I'd had for like 20 years. And, uh, yeah, and then, like, uh, basically, this is where, this is where I, I was conscious enough. It's almost like I was eating this healthy diet. And I was conscious enough, and I was listening to him talk, and he was just like, he rambled about all this spirituality stuff. But then he said a few things that stuck with me. One of them was that... Uh, when you eat dead food, 
Like, piece of an animal who'd suffered, you know, you take on everything that animal went through before they died. You know, they're suffering, you know, the, the, the adrenaline that they felt before they were killed. And I was like, oh my god, karma. I remember that, when I got hit by the car, I caused that. Like, nothing good can come out of me consuming this animal who'd suffered. It was a seed, right? This is how far a seed can go. You don't need to convert someone fully, just plant a powerful seed and it will grow later on. I was calling people out when I was still a meat eater in 2013. Here I am saying, uh, you know, I would be eating a genetically modified pig's carcass. Be honest with yourselves here until you're vegan or vegetarian. I didn't know about vegetarianism. Now, you're not an animal rights activist, you're just a hypocrite. I was a hypocrite, calling people out. So I was already an activist before I was an activist, pretty crazy. And uh, the weeks before prison, um, you know, I was training, getting ready for prison. I uh, lost a little bit of weight, still a bit, uh, you know, not quite there yet. I was partying a lot, using drugs a lot, causing my family crazy stress. And uh, all the way up to getting sentenced, uh, no one was actually in the courtroom on my sentencing day to support me, except for one mate. If you watch a mate, thank you very much. I literally pushed everyone away because of my attitude, because of the way I was. And uh, judge sentenced me. I got, uh, after 18 months of house arrest, I was sentenced to 13 months prison for the firearm. I was waiting for him to let me out, like on a suspended sentence, but I got a six month non parole period, meaning I had to go inside for six months minimum. And that's it, I got processed then. Uh, getting processed pretty crazy. What they do first is you, you go down, they go straight from the courtroom, straight out, and they strip you down. They make you squat over a mirror, they look inside your bum, and uh, you basically lose all freedom and you, you basically lose everything. You, you know, you have to show them everything. And I had nothing inside my bum except the obvious, but some people do carry things inside of there. But you, essentially, you're not, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the prison system. It's a pretty crazy experience. First prison I went to, a lot of my gang members were there. I was part of it, obviously, a full member of a dangerous gang, so that was pretty safe. And then the, the guards, they moved me on to another prison. Oh, oh my God, what's going to happen? The thing is, being in gangs is okay in prison because you've got, you got backup, but also you've got to worry about the other gangs, you know? But if you're just a normal prisoner, you don't have to worry about that. So in some ways, it's a lot more dangerous. Um, but what happened to me in prison is I got sober. I refused to take drugs, it was frowned upon in my gang and I didn't, I wanted to have my head screwed on for the prison system and not do something stupid, get myself stabbed. So I stayed sober and I trained twice a day and this is when I become lucid, conscious for the first time in 12 years, I've always had some type of substance in me and uh, I started to you know, think about what I was eating a bit more and I was uh, eating a little bit more fruits and vegetables, I still wasn't vegan, still eating chicken breast, I thought I needed protein, how wrong I was. Um, but like, I started to see like my life is just a collection of all the mistakes I've made in my past and it's led me to this point. So where do I want, what, what actions do I want to take to lead me to this next point? I've never looked at my life, like, a lot of people make that analysis all the time. I never had, I was living in the moment, what can I do right now, like, you know, running for motion. Um, so I, there's people in there doing life. It's five years, 10 years, 15 years life. I've got friends in there doing 30 years. Over one stupid decision they made, and they're in there for life. And, and I just like, do I want to be in here for life? Like, there's a lot of good people in prison that, that just got dealt a uh, bad hand of cards. There's also a lot of people that, you know, they're in prison for a reason. You know what I mean? And uh, it's just, it's just not a good place to be. And um, yeah, I started to make that realization. I was training twice a day. Uh, there's incredible stresses in prison. I was trying to keep myself focused and not get involved in any of the drama. I got one flight, I think, and that was it. it was okay. The days before my release, I was really worried though that someone was going to deliberately start on me. And, you know, because if you get in, a, in some altercation, the guards know about it, you, you, your prison time is extended. So I was fully anxious. Oh my God, am I going to get out of here? Am I going to get out of here? And so, like, I remember it being just my last day, another gang member from another gang's like, Joey, it's time to go. I'm like, oh God, quick, grab my stuff. And I'm just walking, the gates are opening. I'm like, they're not going to grab me, are they? It's, I was so anxious. Six months, not a long time, but trust me, one week in there is too long. You know, every day, you worry, you're like, oh, what's going to happen, you know, it's just like some people are doing 10 years, horrible, I couldn't imagine it, but even six months was, was long enough, seeing my mum and sister, they picked me up, it was the happiest day of my life, here I am, this is my first day out, grew a little jail beard, that's my younger brother, got a little bit of a tan from training in the sun, um, I was home for another birthday, Christmas, and because um, they put me back on Home D for two months for my parole, then they released me on a normal parole, and uh, so I spent three, <laughs> three birthdays, Christmases, and New Year's 
on home D uh, or in prison. And this is uh, my court pants while I was going to court. That's how much weight I lost. So I was uh, pretty happy about that. That's uh, nearly another me. And uh, I'm gonna tell you how I went vegan. Uh, the story of my mum here. Like my mum had a big part in it. She doesn't even really. She didn't even try to. She just did. I was eating a bit of fruits and vegetables, doing the juices, but I was still eating chicken breast. I thought I needed for protein and that. And I was talking to my mum because I'm sober now, you know. I'm like this moral king of the universe now, mum. Like, what are you doing smoking? I was telling her, like, shit, smoke's bad for you. She just looked at me like, you just put me through 12 years of hell. Who the hell are you to talk to me about smoking? You just got out of prison, dude. Well, it's, been, it's been one month that you already give me a. Like, anyway. She's really nice, she didn't say it like that, she's really nice, my mum, but anyway, she, when she said, she goes, there's a lot of biases people have, they don't change, and when she said that, I reflected, and I said, what's it about me that I haven't changed, and I was like, I've always known, I've been calling people hypocrites since before I was in prison for eating animals. I'm a hypocrite. I always known it's hypocritical to, say, save the whales, care for the dolphins, I love the dog, but I had a dead piece of an animal on my plate. So I was like, you know what, mum, you're right. There are lots of things people don't change, and they should change them if they're wrong. And I'm going vegan tomorrow. Turns out, if you don't believe in destiny, I kind of do, but in my life I believe a little bit in destiny. It was World Vegan Day, didn't know it to the year after, so how's that for craziness? <laughs> I was vocal though from that point onwards. You couldn't shut me up. This is me. This is me Christmas. I went vegan uh, 1st November 2013. This is me Christmas. Oh well, I'm happy and grateful. It could be worse. I could be a turkey freezing in a dark cage. In my own feces waiting to be knocked off and fed to one of you expletives. <laughs> so, straight off the bat, I'm still in the gangs here. I'm still, you know, it's all meat eaters follow me and I'm calling them out. So it was just, it was just in me to be an activist. Um, uh, so my Home D officer actually said um, to me when I was released off of Home D for the last month, did 20 months on Home D, uh, five or six months in prison and then I had to serve the rest of my parole. He said to me, you're not coming back, I know you're not coming back, I've been doing this for decades and I can see it in your eyes the way you're speaking, you're not coming back, so he was right. This is me after leaving the gangs. Now, leaving gangs at that level, it's not easy. It's not like, hey mate, uh, this is, well it's not as easy as you think. It can be, it can be complicated, it can be a bit dangerous. You know, and I was a bit anxious about it, but then, you know, I went, I went and I said, look, it's time for me to leave. I, another friend had left and I was like, look, obviously it's not, you know, <laughs> they, they kind of knew that my posts on Facebook had changed. They said, we had an idea that you were, you know, not, not sort of with it anymore. I wouldn't have been a good gang member anymore anyway. Like I was just not, you know, I was, I was past it. But it was the hardest year of my life leaving the gangs and being sober by myself. I no longer had anyone to protect me. I had to break my ego back to who was I? Who am I? Like, I'm not a gang member anymore. I don't have my mates. Where's my gun if something happens? Like, I was riddled with trauma. I, I, I always, I was so concerned for my safety. There was a massive war going on. People I knew were getting stabbed up, bashed up, broken limbs, uh, shot up. It was uh, insane. I, I'm by myself. I don't go to police. That's not, not something that I would do. I was having incredibly bad violent nightmares. I was filled with anxiety. It was, a, it was the hardest thing, and I didn't get to use alcohol or drugs as a crutch, which I desperately needed. But it was hard, but I'm glad I went through that hard year, because staying sober was the best decision I ever made. If I touched one beer, it would have been all over. Back to normal. Here I am, new vegan 2015, ready to take on animal agriculture. <laughs> Finding my feet in the world. I was like, who am I? Maybe I was saying, who am I? Like, what am I going to do? I had this fire inside of my chest, and it's really bizarre. I don't know how else to explain it. An actual burning ember of like desire. And every time I fell asleep and woke up, I was like, I've got to do something, man. Like, I've wasted all this time causing people hardship. And, you know, what have I done? What have I done except cause a negative impact? I need to leave a positive impact. I want to inspire people. I want to help people. People first. Then I realised that the animals need my help even more. So that's why I focused on them. Now, if any of you have that fire inside your chest, never deny yourself the chance to spread it because that's your purpose and it's calling out to you. I 
YouTube video April 2015. I was like, this is a good platform to inspire people on. And uh, first YouTube video isn't always going to be good, but you got to do it. You got to do it. Just do that first one, get it out of the way. I, uh, after going out with my friend Martin from uh, Think About This, he had a video called Drunken Opinions where he was doing interviews, and I was like, oh, I could do that. And uh, it inspired me to start the first uh, animal rights focused uh, street interviews uh, called Joey vs. the Public. Who, know, who remembers those old school ones? <laughs> <laughs> Not many, about three people, that's how many followers I had back then. Yeah, I'm still <laughs> Also started to film my outreach. It wasn't being done on social media, filming outreach. I was having debates, this is October 2015. Get my phone out and I'm like, why would I just have this debate with this person when the whole world can listen to it? Well, well there's 4,000 people, but, but, method to my magnet, uh, madness, why would I have a one-on-one -on -one when I could share it with thousands of people, which is what I do now. You know, so all these people who would otherwise not have heard it, have now heard it. Um, and that's why I was magnifying my outreach efforts. And before then, it was just, you know, I started doing uh, with the screens and the slaughterhouse footage and things like this, and it all just sort of stemmed from just spontaneity, basically. Doing it all with my little iPhone 5. Um, this is my dad, I'm going to talk about my dad because he's an integral part of my activism and I'll tell, explain why. My father was uh, got really sick, he was dying for the last uh, five years of his life, he was dying. And we spent a lot of time on, together on house arrest when I was drinking and we socialised like that, but when I got sober, I didn't really, you know, my dad was sick and he was listening to the doctors had Crohn's disease, they were feeding him dairy through a tube, and I'm like, Dad, they're killing you with meat and dairy, and he's like, Joey, what, what do you know, you're not a doctor, I've got 20 doctors telling me, I'm like, oh, what about doctor, I'm trying to tell them about Dr. McDougall, Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. Mark Platt, I'm like, dude, they are killing you, Dad, and he, they wouldn't listen to me, I was having fights with my brother, it was horrible, I had to, like, distance myself, they were cutting parts, body parts out of him, you know, it was just, it was horrible, and so I, I distanced myself from my father, and I regret it a lot, because uh, I got a phone call from my brother one day, and he was crying, and he's like, you know, you've got to get down here, your dad's not uh, well. And uh, we went to the hospital and, uh, you know, he got bad news from the doctor and he said, you don't have much time. And I didn't realise he meant not much time as in, like, very soon. So I went home and I was like, Dad, we're going to spend the whole weekend together, you know. It's going to be great. Like, I love you, Dad. It's all good. Went home, got a phone call, 3 a.m. Mum, it's Mum. Your dad's about to die. Get down to the hospital. So I was so an animal rights activist, been spending a lot of time on YouTube. I was very dedicated to, to spreading the message, and I was like, I, you know, I went down to the hospital, and he was like laying, hunched over. His lungs had collapsed. It was a complication from, you know, Crohn's disease and many things, immune system, and uh, yeah. And I, I was holding his hand, and he looked me in the eyes. He knew we came. He was smiling. He knew we were there. He couldn't speak. My mum and family was all around him. And he faded away there, and I watched his eyes fade away, and I watched him die in front of me, and um, it gave me this, amongst other things, the reality of mortality, and uh, that we're all going to die one day, and what are you going to do while you're here, you know? After Dad died, we found a clip uh, of him. And he has to hit him again. And he's not giving up. And he's just not. But he's going to try his hardest to just stay up. And that's what we all got to do. Every one of us has to fight. Give up. Not to fight. But don't give up. I wear my dad's ashes around my neck. He's with me always. I've got Never Give Up engraved on this here. And uh, life can get hard. Um, you know, it can be even harder advocating for animals in a world that doesn't care. But no matter how hard it is for us, it's always a lot harder for the non-human animals on this earth. And uh, we have to always stay strong and never give up. I will always apply the words of my father to my animal rights activism, and I hope you will too. So this is me, angry at what animal agriculture are doing to the non-human animals, and I'm generating my anger into action, productive action. Anger is a good emotion if you use it uh, in a productive way. 
This here was after I, uh, this was January 2018, uh, set an intention to bring, uh, just, just an intention, just put it out there, I want to bring ethical uh, animal rights veganism to the forefront of the mainstream media. I was just like, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. You know, he called this the vegan prophecy, you know, what, what will happen, vegan prophecy to it. I didn't actually expect to happen what transpired after that. There was a worldwide media search, like after this video here, this got uh, 6 million views at the time, it's now on 7.3 million. I was uh, reached out to by a film documentary maker, she worked for Victoria Derbyshire. Created this little uh, piece on the vegans versus farmers. This lady here claimed she was being threatened by vegans, turns out that turned out to be false, but it went viral. Uh, she said that it was one of her best performing uh, short documentaries she'd ever made, she couldn't believe it. Got me on this show here with Jeremy Vine, and uh, I was like, who's Jeremy Vine? I'm from Australia, mate, I don't know who that is. I'll debate anyone, and then uh, it turns out he had seven million listeners, you know, and he had a ham sandwich on the table, and I was like, you know that pig suffered and didn't want to die inside of a gas chamber, and uh, I was very direct. Australian dude saying all this stuff. There was, a, there was so many articles. They were talking about it. Like I couldn't. It was so overwhelmed with articles. This is just a few of them. My even my hometown was talking about it in Adelaide. Multiple radio debates with radio hosts and journalists were caught, contacted me for interviews, and I was debating farmers. I, I was editing all my own content. I only had one other person with me at this stage. So I'm going crazy at this stage. Like burning out pretty soon, I would say. But then. Also got this, uh, he went with this interview on this morning. There's a old Phil pointing at pathetic canines, thinks he's a lion, hilarious. Um, got on this because uh, we, uh, there's a couple of farmers who said they got threatened by vegans. All these are looking, where's the evidence of these threats? I just don't know. Um, you know, and, uh, that, that actually got more media, um, you know, it was kicking off and then every time I speak on the radio or TV it just seems to get media, maybe it's the way that I speak about animal rights, very direct. Denied access to the UK. Wrong with it with a cow being milked for milk? It's unnecessary. What? Why do you well, need like breast milk? milk? No, it is not. You breast milk from a cow? You're not a baby cow, bro. It is not unnecessary. I'm not a baby no, cow, you're not bro. a baby cow. No. You're, a, you're a human being. Guys, that is, it's not unnecessary. I'm certainly not a baby cow, bro. It's That's not sure. unnecessary nowadays. Exposing my own criminal past for the last five, six years, dude. It was nothing like special, very bro, but like we, uh, this is uh, some more media that happened. This is later on. Look, a lot of ha has happened. I want to talk about some uh, the, the other media that's happened. This was a, this uh, uh, interview with uh, the Today Show, and this is a hunter here. Didn't particularly like this hunter. She thought it was humane to shoot deer in the heart, and uh, there was a bit more media because of those, been a bit more controversy. Um, Veganville. Uh, this has got a million views each episode. I was on BBC One, uh, biggest channel in the UK, I think it is, and then it's been on BBC Three. And there was uh, farmers didn't like it very much; they thought it was uh, too biased towards vegans. But hey, maybe that's for a change. You know what I mean? And uh, this is my reunion with Jeremy Vine, still mates now, or mate Jezza. And, uh, you know, it's crazy that, like me coming from where I come from, ex gang member, rock bottom, you know, using drugs in the world I come from, end up on UK TV debating all these people I didn't even know who they were. I uh, didn't think I would come this far. Like, my impact has reached tens of millions just through the media alone, and then uh, I've got to go on at over 100 million views on social media. Always with an animal rights message, always. Whenever I get on TV, radio, it's always animal rights. After 
2018 craziness, so I was feeling close to burnout, and activism struggle, struggles, I've been exposed to a lot of criticism, a lot more people were criticising my work and me. Highs and lows, and uh, still feeling the impact of my past. If you have a crazy past, you should maybe look into getting treated. I didn't, I thought if I got sober, went vegan, everything would be good. Turns out it wasn't. Uh, I was diagnosed with something called complex PTSD, so when you have one instance of trauma, it's easy for therapists to target it, but when you have multiple instances of trauma, much dip more difficult. So I was in a year worth of therapy to treat it. I feel like I'm about 70% better. Thank you to my therapist for that. So, Vegan. Veganism is a non-action. You've stopped doing something egregious and cruel to the non-human animals. You know, you've, you were doing something morally wrong to the animal. You've stopped, okay? Doesn't necessarily make you Mother Teresa to, to realise and stop doing something egregious and, and cruel. Veganism is a neutral position, really, when you think about it. And this is quote Desmond Tutu, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So, I believe it's a moral imperative to not just be vegan, but to also be an activist. Whenever I say that, they're like, Joe, you expect me to go up and debate Piers Morgan, stop slaughterhouse trucks with my bare hands? No. Utilise the skills you possess in the movement and be creative about it. Like, don't think you have to do what anyone else does. Speak to your strengths and your skills and don't overwhelm yourself, but step outside your comfort zone, you'll be you will surprise yourself. Don't wait, don't make this mistake and wait till you're perfect to start. If I waited till I was perfect, you know, I never would have started. The perfect activist doesn't exist, unless your name's Earthling again, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves that, eh? Come on. But, uh, don't wait you perfect, you just gotta start, the animals need you. And I wanna say, do you want the best activist advice you'll ever hear? The best activist advice? Are you ready? Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can, follow your heart, and don't give a damn what anyone thinks about it. There's only one way to avoid criticism. Do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. Okay, so you're always gonna get it. This is uh, my first rescue, Smalley. This is a dead animal in a broiler farm. Um, this is, you know, very hard to, I was so protective over Smalley. Animals would save themselves if they could, but they can't. They are helpless beings, and they need you. They cannot protest, they can't form coalitions and speak for themselves. They need you, and you, and you as well, and all of you. <laughs> so, I hope my life story inspires you in some way. I'm now eight years vegan and around eight and a half years sober. I never would have dreamed that all those years ago, sitting in solitary confinement, like, just at rock bottom, that my life would have turned out the way it has. And so I was given... Thank you. I was given a second chance, basically. A lot, a lot of my friends, they didn't get it. You know what I mean? I would never take it for granted. So, no matter your life, up to this point, no matter your struggles, anyone can rise from the ashes and make a difference. And I'll leave you with this quote that I made back in 2016. There's a fire inside your heart, let it light up the world. Thank you.